enjoyed your extra night of, or not night, extra hour of sleep last night. Well, good, because there's a pop quiz this morning. So let's see how well you're ready for it. Well, let's see how well your hands are. Are you ready to answer? So how many of you here know the laws of the United States so well that you have all of them memorized? Anybody? What? Okay, Adam, good, okay. Well, how many of you not only have laws memorized, but can advise others as to what the laws mean, why they were created, and what the penalties are if you violate those laws? Anybody? So we haven't had anyone here go to law school. <laughs> All right, now this one might be something we are a little bit more familiar with. How many of you here could give me all of the rules and codes from the Bible? Um, <laughs> nobody? Well, nobody knows what some of the laws mean or their purpose or penalty of violation. You couldn't explain it to someone on the street? Some, not all. Some, not all? <laughs> well, we, I was looking for all. Yeah. But that's okay. Some is better than, than none. Or some. <clears throat> but just the way we answer the questions this morning... I think is a good reminder for us the difference between the world we live in now and the world that Jesus lived in many years ago. See, the law was key in Jesus' society. The scribes spent their time making sure people met the standard of living as a righteous person before God. They were responsible for making sure that they, as well as everyone in the community, lived up to the letter of the law. And in case you didn't know, in Jesus' time, that meant there were 613 codes. Can you believe that? That was plenty to keep the scribes busy. That is why we see the scribes trying to discredit Jesus with the law. It was their job, their culture, and the expectation of the time. In fact, we see the scribes 19 times in the Gospel of Mark in its short 16 chapters. This particular encounter, though, today is the only one that could be considered positive from the scribe's perspective. But let's think a little bit about what today's life is like. What world do we find ourselves in? Is it one that focuses on the law? Actually, if you look at some recent studies and polls, you'll see that the United States has experienced a major shift when it comes to the culture around religion. 50% of the people in this country no longer will identify with the denomination. That's not to say that they don't identify with God or even believe in God, but they will not claim a particular denomination as home. There's a decrease across all mainline denominations in membership as well as attendance. And we're seeing an increase of people that consider themselves spiritual but not religious. We're experiencing a people a culture of people who still believe in a higher being, but do not necessarily claim a tie to a higher institution. <laughs> and we're seeing a world very different than the one Jesus lived in, one that a Gallup poll confirmed recently by saying that the religious atmosphere is more focused on the self than ever before. And in this particular poll, the Gallup group asked a question about what it takes to go to heaven. And they gave people options like being honest, being kind, being kind towards your neighbor, obeying the Ten Commandments, giving your life to Christ, and the list could go on and they even let you give your own reason if they didn't have it for you. The answers they found were very similar to those of Robert Bella's work. See, he's interviewed several people that claim to be Christian or have some faith in God. Just take this interview he had with a woman named Sheila. She claims her religion is Sheila is up. She believes in God. But the God she agrees, but the God she has agrees with everything that Sheila does. So it's okay, you can laugh. They pretty crowd laugh. So Sheila's God wants her to do whatever Sheila wants to do. Whatever will make her happy in life. But like many in the current culture of the United States. Rules and guidelines from someone else is considered repressive. Having to make a choice that's considered perhaps right morally or ethically, but is not comfortable for someone personally, is no longer an acceptable option for many people. 
or at least that's what this study claims to find. So, considering the two very different worlds, the one that Jesus lived in and the one we live in today, how might the gospel speak to us? In a world where the law is no longer the focus of our religious community and culture, I can think of three things. There is still a call for us to love the Lord our God, a call for us to love our neighbor, and a call for us to help people experience the kingdom of God here on earth. So first, we need to talk about what it means to love the Lord our God. And in our scripture text this morning, you heard the phrase, Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel is a call the Jewish community used on a daily basis. It was a call to love the Lord your God with all of their heart, their mind, their soul, and their strength. It was a call to remind them of the law given by God through Moses. It was something that they did not take lightly. So like the community in Jesus' time, we too are called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. We may not be as familiar with the direct quote from Deuteronomy 6.4, as the scribes and Jewish people were at the time, but there is still something today that calls us to love. So I ask you, what calls you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength? And what do you do daily to remind yourself that you're called to love in such a way? And are you actually living that out, that love out daily? <clears throat> Second, we're reminded by Jesus to love our neighbor. Jesus gives an answer here more than what the scribe had asked for. He reminds them specifically of what Leviticus 19.18 says and calls them to do. You have to understand that in the original time that Leviticus was written, loving your neighbor meant loving other people in the Jewish community. By the time that Jesus shares this, and the understanding of neighbor had expanded to loving even non-Jews. So everyone is included in this statement. For me, I think this is a similar call that we have to follow out today. It's not just loving our neighbors as we want to be loved. It's sometimes loving the neighbor that's difficult to love. The simple call hasn't changed, my friends. We are to simply love our neighbors. To love the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims, the Hindus, the spiritual but not religious, the folk that may not look like us, may not talk like us, that don't eat like us, perhaps they don't sound like us. But I think you get the picture here. We are to love, and to love our neighbor. I think we've learned this past week through the raging roar of Sandy Storm, the importance of loving our neighbor. If it weren't for the actions of so many neighbors, there would be many people left without water, without opportunities to charge up their cell phones and contact loved ones, who wouldn't be able to access necessary medical treatment and food. So what are you doing in your life to share the love of your neighbor? The kids identified some things you do as a church, but what about you and your individual lives? What opportunities do you seek on a daily basis to love your neighbor? And more importantly, think about this week. There's still storm recovery to be had, but an important election on our hands that tends to be dividing this country. What opportunities will you seek out to show your love to your neighbor this week, especially when we looking to see how the world turns? But inherent in the call to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbors is the call to the experience of the kingdom of God. If we answer the call to love the Lord our God, and to live a faithful life where we love our neighbor, then we will come near to the kingdom of God. Just like the world Jesus lived in, the kingdom of God was so desperately needed then as it is now. Perhaps by living the life we are called to by God, we can create such a scene that Jesus did, where people will be in utter amazement and shocked in the silence at the nearness of the kingdom of God at hand. May it be so for you and for me. Amen. Amen. Amen.